Hello everyone, welcome back to a, another week of Reading with Raptors. Uh, I'm Kelsey, today we are reading with Maller, the American Kestrel. Um, we're going to be reading a, a book all about very, very tiny things today called The Tiny Seed. So this is a very, very tiny copy of this book, so I figured an American Kestrel would be a great fit to read with this week. Um, before we get started, I wanted to say thank you so much to everyone who helped support us during our big fundraising push on Give to the Max Day this last Thursday. Um, we were able to actually meet our match, so we were able to um, raise just a great amount of support and dollars to help support our work, especially down in the clinic for all of the birds that we're still taking care of and trying to get back out into the wild, um, as well as supporting all of the other great kind of research and service work that we're doing here at the Raptor Center. So thank you all so, so much for helping to support us. And thank you again for joining us every week for Reading with Raptors. It has been a ton of fun. I am having a blast. Hopefully you are all as well. Um, so thanks for continuing to tune in to our Facebook Live programs. With all that said, like I said, this is an American kestrel, so the smallest species of falcon that we have here in North America. So a great fit for a book that I was really excited. A friend actually found this for me. This is an Eric Carle book, a really excellent artist and um, really children's book giant, uh, Eric Carle. This is The Tiny Seed. And I love this book because it actually starts off by talking about the autumn. And I thought that for a nice kind of end of November day, it'd be a great choice for talking about kind of autumn. So let's get started. So this is The Tiny Seed. The text is pretty small, so I'll show you the big pictures and I'll try to give you some close-up views as well. It is autumn. A strong wind is blowing. It blows flower seeds high into the air and carries them far across the land. One of the seeds is tiny, smaller than any of the others. Will it be able to keep up with the others? And where are they all going? Here we can see we earlier in autumn than we are now, but we have these beautiful autumn colors and all of the seeds and leaves drifting away. Where are they all going? One of the seeds flies higher than the others. Up it goes. It flies too high and the sun's hot rays burn it up. But the tiny seed sails on with the others. You can see that big, glorious autumn sun, all those leaves and seeds around. You can see one of them is not having a good time. But our tiny seed down here, it stays nice and safe. Another seed lands on a tall and icy mountain. The ice never melts and the seed cannot grow. The rest of the seeds fly on. But the tiny seed does not go as fast as the others. You can see that sun setting, you have the mountains. Here we have all of these big seeds flying around. Here's the one that landed on that ice cap and here is our tiny seed way up there. I wonder where it will end up. Now they fly over the ocean. One seed falls into the water and drowns. The others sail on with the wind. But the tiny seed does not go as high as the others. Here we have this beautiful water and this fish. Here is a seed landing in the water. The other seeds flying high. Here's our tiny seed down here. Find out what happens to it next. One seed drifts down onto the desert. It is hot and dry and the seed cannot grow. Now the tiny seed is flying very low, but the wind pushes it on with the others. So here we have the desert. You can see these cacti here with their nice little spines. Here's the seed that's fallen down onto this really dry ground where it might not be able to grow. Here are our tall, high up seeds. And down here we have our tiny seed. Finally, the wind stops and the seeds fall gently down on the ground. 
A bird comes by and eats one seed. The tiny seed is not eaten. It is so small that the bird does not see it. Here's this beautiful, colorful bird eating a seed. Here on the ground are other seeds, really big. And then here, very well hidden, is our tiny seed. So too small for the bird to see. Wonder what will happen to the rest of these seeds. Sorry, my pages are sticking. There we go. Oh no, my pages are falling apart. There we go. Now it is winter. After their long trip, the seeds settle down. They look just as if they are going to sleep in the earth. Snow falls and covers them like a soft white blanket. A hungry mouse that also lives in the ground eats a seed for his lunch. But the tiny seed lies very still and the mouse does not see it. So you can see here we have the winter. Some of us are getting pretty familiar with this kind of grayish blue sky with the snow falling down. This light blanket of snow. And down here a mouse feasting on a few of these bigger seeds. But don't worry, our tiny seed is still here. A little bit too small to see. Now it is spring. After a few months, the snow has melted. It is really spring. Birds fly by, the sun shines, rain falls. The seeds grow so round and full, they start to burst open a little. Now they are not seeds anymore. They are plants. First, they send roots down into the earth. Then their little stems and leaves begin to grow up towards the sun and air. There is another plant that grows much faster than the new little plants. It is a big fat weed. And it takes all the sunlight and the rain away from one of the small new plants. And that little plant dies. Getting a good stretch behind us here. The tiny seed hasn't begun to grow yet. It will be too late. Hurry. But finally, it too starts to grow into a plant. So here's this glorious springtime. Big bright sun, those birds flying overhead, the rain falling down. Here are our bigger seeds that are growing up into these plants. Here's this large weed, this really large, fast growing plant that is pushing out all of the sun and the resources from this little tiny plant. And right here in the middle, we have our tiny seed just starting to grow. The warm weather also brings the children out to play. They too have been waiting for the sun and springtime. One child doesn't see the plants as he runs along and, oh, he breaks one. Now it cannot grow anymore. So here we have our two big plants and one of them is being stepped on by a foot. Here's our tiny seed growing into that tiny plant. We're getting some excellent preening from our American Kestrel guest. He's running his beak through his feathers to keep them really nice and clean and organized. Let him finish preening while we read some more. The tiny plant that grew from the tiny seed is growing fast, but its neighbor grows even faster. Before the tiny plant has three leaves, the other plant has seven. And look, a bud, and now even a flower. But what is happening? First, there are footsteps. Then a shadow looms over them. Then a hand reaches down and breaks off the flower. So here we have our tiny plant from our tiny seed down here. Here we have this much bigger plant that was growing from the bigger seeds and a hand reaching down to pick the flower. A boy has picked the flower to give to a friend. See our two kids here enjoying this flower. It is summer. Now the tiny plant from the tiny seed is all alone. It grows on and on. 
it doesn't stop. The sun shines on it and the rain waters it. It has many leaves. It grows taller and taller. It is taller than the people. It is taller than the trees. It is taller than the houses. And now a flower grows on it. People come from far and near to look at this flower. It is the tallest flower they have ever seen. It is a giant flower. You can see this amazingly large flower growing. All the people down below, there's even a dog down here looking at it. Way bigger than the trees and the house that's there. My goodness. What will happen next to this plant? All summer long, the birds and bees and butterflies come visiting. They have never seen such a big and beautiful flower. We have this giant flower, the sun is shining. We have lots of these beautiful birds and butterflies. I see little honeybees, all sorts of bugs and birds coming to look at this flower. Maybe get nectar from, maybe pollinate. Now it is autumn again. The days grow shorter, the nights grow colder, and the wind carries yellow and red leaves past the flower. Some petals drop from the giant flower and they sail along with the bright leaves over the land and down to the ground. You can see that big flower getting blown around in that autumn wind. These beautiful trees here too, their leaves are starting to leave for the winter as well. The wind blows harder. The flower has lost almost all of its petals. It sways and bends away from the wind, but the wind grows stronger and shakes the flower. Once more, the wind shakes the flower, and this time, the flower's seed pod opens. Out come many tiny seeds that quickly sail away, or that sail far away on the wind. So here we can see the seeds from this flower sailing away in the wind. All these different kind of shapes and sizes of little seeds, all coming from the plants that that tiny seed from earlier grew into. That is our last page, yes, this is our last page, as the seeds fly away into the wind. It's coming back to our very first page, where we have all these different seeds going on their journey. So this was a nice little short book, but I, I thought it was great. Eric, oops, this side, Eric Carl's The Tiny Seed. I just love this little book because it talks a lot about kind of how our plants and animals are kind of moving around and changing during the different seasons. So right now we're kind of, especially up here in Minnesota, kind of at the tail end of autumn when all of those kind of seeds and things have kind of found their way down onto the ground, are getting underneath a little blanket of snow. A lot of our native plants actually need the cold weather of the winter to help them kind of germinate or grow into plants next spring. So this is actually a really important part of their annual growth cycle, which is really cool to think about. I also, so a few things about this bird while he's doing all of this very intense preening. Uh, this is an American kestrel. This is the smallest kind of falcon that we have here in North America. They also have a really important seasonal cycle. Right now, most of our American kestrels from here in the northern part of the US and Canada, they're actually all down in the southern US and down into Central America because they need to migrate. Just like a lot of small birds and a lot of our insects do, they need to travel somewhere a little bit warmer to both stay warm and to find food all winter long. So most of the American kestrels, if you're up here in kind of the northern parts of North America, your American kestrels are probably a little bit further south right now. They'll be back in the spring. So they're gonna spend the winter down where it's a little bit warmer and there's a lot more food. They actually have one of the, I think, most interesting migrations of a lot of raptors. They actually follow the migration of the Darner dragonfly, which are those really big, bright green, crunchy dragonflies that actually are here kind of in most of North America for most of the summer. 
they actually migrate down to Central America and American kestrels follow them. It's kind of like if we're on a road trip and we have to stop and get fast food. These guys can be flying, grab onto those dragonflies while they're doing their own migration, eat them, and then keep on going. So following a food source, very, very smart, very clever. You can see he's doing a lot of preening right now. He is, okay, I'm sorry, I'm giggling. Um, I always think that it looks kind of silly, right? When he's kind of rubbing the sides of his face on his feathers. But he's actually doing something really important. Right now, you can kind of see from this front angle, he's kind of reaching to the top of his tail. Like right now, he's reaching the top of his tail. He's actually rubbing the side of his face against a tiny little spot right above his tail called his preen gland. Just a little spot that actually makes a very special oil. So right now he's reaching for it and then he's rubbing the sides of his face on those feathers. That's how he's able to kind of keep his feathers really clean, helps keep them a little bit waterproofed. It's actually also how these birds actually get vitamin D. A lot of us are familiar with vitamin D because we get it when we're out in the sun. Our skin is able to take in kind of the ultraviolet rays from the sun and create our own vitamin D that way. But these birds, as you can imagine, they don't really have a lot of skin out to do that. So instead, a lot of birds have it in the oil in their preen gland. So that way when they're preening, oil gets onto their feathers. The rays from the sun will help convert it into a form of vitamin D that they can actually use. And when they preen their feathers again, they actually eat it. And that's how they get a lot of that very important nutrient, vitamin D, which I think is very cool. So he's doing some very important work right now, both making sure that he gets that very important vitamin, but mainly cleaning those feathers, keeping them really nice and organized. I think his face looks a little extra kind of fluffy the way that the feathers kind of move around right now. I'm sorry, I keep giggling. I just think it's really cool to watch. You can see he's also rubbing his beak along those feathers. So what he's doing there is he's kind of zipping all of those feathers back together. I'll see if I can actually have some feathers sitting here. So this is, this is a feather from a peregrine falcon, a larger cousin of the American kestrel. You can see if I kind of mess it up. So if I kind of use my fingers and kind of touch it, or say if a bird was flying, or maybe brushed up against a tree or something like that, they might mess their feathers up a little bit. What he's doing with his beak is kind of running his beak along the feather and kind of zipping these all back together. Microscopic, teeny, teeny, tiny little hooks are what's holding these feathers together like this. So there's a tiny little part on this one that's broken, so I can't quite zip it all the way back up. My fingers aren't the best for this either. Beaks are really good at this. But he's actually kind of zipping together, kind of hooking all those little hooks together and keeping those feathers nice and intact, like this side of this feather. So a few questions about this particular American kestrel. So he is, uh, I'm referring to him as he, um, most raptors, it's really hard to tell the difference between the girls and the boys or the males and the females. Usually with raptors, you kind of have to do a little bit of guessing. Usually you can tell a little bit based off of their size in that usually the girls or the females are larger, but that can be kind of hard to tell, especially if you're looking at a, the two birds at a distance or you're not seeing them next to each other, it can get kind of hard to tell. For American kestrels, they're one of the kind of relatively few for or raptors where you can actually tell the difference mainly by looking at them. So this one you can see on these very fluffy feathers on his belly. He's gonna fluff those all out. Um, you can see he's got these wonderful polka dots. On the sides of his wings too, I'll see if at some point I can see if he'll turn a little bit. But you can see he has these very bright bluish gray wings. The females, or the girls, tend to have stripes all down their chests and bellies, and they also have brown and black stripes all down their wings, so they look a little bit different. So a little bit um, kind of brighter, maybe more showy colors on this American kestrel, which works out great since these are pretty tiny raptors, even though they are excellent hunters of things like mice and small lizards and snakes and those big crunchy insects like dragonflies and grasshoppers, along with other smaller birds, things like sparrows or finches, the little small fluffy birds. They're great at catching all of those, but this bird, he weighs about a quarter of a pound. That's the same as if you have a stick of butter in your fridge right now. It's about how much he weighs, a little bit under a quarter of a pound. So even though these birds are great 
excellent predators out in their big open grassland habitat, they can still be food for a lot of other animals, including other larger raptors, especially things like Cooper's hawks or other falcons, along with other ground animals like a raccoon or a fox or even cats or dogs. So they need some camouflage to help keep themselves safe, but they also want to be able to show other American kestrels, hey, this is my territory, everyone else go away. So if you have one set of your pair have the kind of showier colors that show up a little bit more brightly and can t display to other kestrels that, hey, this is our nesting territory, everyone else leave. And then the female has the kind of more camouflage, those darker brown and black kind of colors to blend in with the holes in the dead trees that they might be finding to nest in works out pretty well. So at least you have one parent who's a little bit better hidden for sneaking in and out of that nest kind of hole, the hole in a dead tree or nest box that maybe they found that people built. So usually for American kestrels, you can actually tell the males and the females or the boys and the girls apart. So if you see a bird similar to this one in shape and size, oftentimes you'll see them bobbing their heads or kind of bobbing their tails up and down. I'll see if he demonstrates that here in a little bit. I have a couple little pieces of food I might hand him so that you might be able to see that. But you might see a bird that looks very similar doing something kind of like that. You might be looking at a female bird if you're seeing lots of those stripey colors. Doing some more excellent preening here. I'll also point out too when I'm talking about feathers as well the lines underneath his face, um, kind of underneath his eyes right here, we actually call this bird Maller after these Maller stripes underneath his eyes, M-A-L-A-R, Maller. It's a very fancy way of saying cheek stripes. Some of us might actually be familiar with this if we're big sports fans. A lot of times people will recognize these from a lot of football or baseball or soccer players who put the dark lines underneath their eyes when they're under those bright stadium lights. Athletes in those kinds of sports are actually doing a really similar activity to American kestrels. American kestrels are normally out in big open flat areas in the middle of the day where there are huge bright lights. They're flying around really fast and they're looking for some really small animals and trying to catch them. So they need to be really, really fast and really accurate with how they grab onto things. Just like a lot of our athletes are. They're in big open fields with no shade. They have big bright lights and they need to be able to catch or throw or kick balls and things like that. So they need to really be able to see what they're doing even with those bright lights. So just like athletes, these birds have their built-in sunglasses, these dark stripes that help keep, keep the light from reflecting off of their cheeks. So instead of bouncing off their cheeks and going into their eyes, that glare is absorbed by those dark stripes under their eyes. Keeps the glare of the sun out, acts like built-in sunglasses. So we call this bird Maller after these very important cheek stripes. And you can usually see these on falcons. All falcons are usually kind of hunting in those big open areas, hunting for fast moving animals like other birds or insects or even bats. So they need to be really able to see what they're doing and where they're going. So usually if you're looking at a raptor, one of the things that will tell us if it's a falcon or not are those nice big mallard stripes, so those big dark patches under their eyes. Let me see, I have a tiny a little piece of food here. So you can see, um, so I was kind of taking the piece of food out, you could see some of the little kind of tail bobbing as he's thinking, going, maybe there's some more food here. You can see that kind of tail bobbing. I wanted to make sure that we could all see that because it is really helpful for finding these American kestrels out in the wild. Since they're pretty small, kind of hard to see, I actually usually see them if I am in a car or on the bus on kind of a more rural kind of country road. I'll see them on an electrical line or some of those low branches that are hanging down next to a open kind of ditch area or a big farmer's field. I'll see them, they'll be the one bird sitting on those electrical lines, bobbing their tail or bobbing their head and bobbing that tail back and forth. It's usually how I can identify them, especially when you're going at pretty high speed and you might not be able to stop and actually look at them. Otherwise, I usually see them a lot in big open kind of parkland areas. Um, a lot of here in Minnesota, a lot of our state parks, especially in the kind of southern and western parts of the state, we see a lot of American kestrels with those big open grassy fields. You'll see big nest boxes set up for them as well. 
um, but also in a lot of our kind of state or uh, local regional parks as well. Kind of those nice big open grassy areas is where we see a lot of them. Um, as you get, like I said, further south into the U.S., you can see more of them in kind of those big open grassy areas and might be able to see them all year round, depending on where you're at. I'm going to scroll through and see if I'm missing any questions here. I think I got all of them that came through. Uh, oh, uh, somebody had asked too why this bird lives with us. So this bird, okay, I think I got everything. Um, so this bird, Maller, um, he actually came to the Raptor Center here about eight years ago, if I recall correctly. Um, and so eight years ago, he was a kind of first year bird. He had just hatched earlier in the spring, kind of gotten to the fall um, when he was doing that first big migration. And then he either ran into something or something ran into him. We're not quite sure what happened because he can't tell us, but we do know that he actually broke a bone kind of in his equivalent of a wrist. So kind of that last joint that's kind of tucked up. Um, the one that he was actually preening a lot of earlier when he was doing kind of rubbing his beak on it. That was kind of his wrist joint. And so on his left wrist, he broke a bone. He was brought into the Raptor Center. We were able to fix it all up. It just didn't heal quite the way that it needed to, to let him fly at 100%. He can fly pretty well. We actually do a lot of really cool kind of flighted programs, and we're working on bringing more of those and improving how we're doing those for people here at the Raptor Center while we're doing all of our programs online, which is really exciting. But for being out in the wild, catching flying birds and insects, as well as avoiding predators, these American kestrels really need to be at their top flying ability. And he, his flight is just not quite good enough on those especially longer distances. It'd be really hard for him to survive on his own in the wild. So that is why he lives with us here at the Raptor Center and has been teaching people about American kestrels for about eight years now, which is pretty fantastic. One last thing I'll point out too, now that he's kind of turned over to the side, you can see some of that blue kind of feathers on his wing. So the kind of nice bluish gray color I was mentioning earlier with the kind of male or boy American kestrels kind of helps them show up a little bit more. So again, if you're trying to indicate or kind of trying to show other American kestrels, hey, this is where my nest is. This is where I hunt. Everyone else go away. It's very nice to have some big flashy colors there so that everyone can see you a little bit better, especially when you're pretty tiny. So that's usually where we see some of the kind of only color differences that we see between kind of the boys and the girls tend to be in these kind of smaller raptors. I'm gonna make sure I'm not missing any last questions. Oh, lots of people watching, this is fantastic. Well, thank you all again for joining us here for Reading with Raptors. And again, if you didn't catch it at the beginning, thank you all so much for your support uh, last week on Thursday for Give to the Max. Again, we were able to kind of meet our big match kind of challenge for our fundraising, which was phenomenal and so, so helpful. Um, being able to, again, really support a lot of the work, especially down in the clinic where we're still on track to see a really high number of birds this year. Um, generally in the last few years, we've been seeing between about 800 and 1,000 wild raptors every year. And they don't usually leave a forwarding address for their vet bills. So we wanna make sure that we're able to help all of those birds. So all of the support is so helpful and so appreciated. So thank you all again so much. We will see you next week for more Reading with Raptors. Hope everybody's celebrating holidays this weekend for Thanksgiving. Uh, it has a safe and enjoyable time. We see some birds outside. I saw some bald eagles at the pond near me the other day, which was very exciting. So hopefully other people are getting out and doing some bird watching as well. Otherwise, everyone have a great rest of your week. We will see you next week for more Reading with Raptors. Bye everyone.